So hi everyone, my name is Adiola Agoke. I am a teaching faculty in the Department of African Cultural Studies. And this afternoon, I am so thrilled to welcome to UW Madison's Africa at Noon Lecture Series, a distinguished scholar and African poet, Professor Adoremi Raji Oyelade, AKA Remi Raji. So feel free to call him Remi Raji. He is a professor of English at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, whose scholarly work engages with African cultures, literature, and creative writing. He teaches literature of the African diaspora, literary theory, creative writing, and new media in the Department of English, University of Ibadan, Nigeria. His scholarly essays have appeared in top tiered journals including research in African literatures, Ariel, Wasafari, Matatu, and African literature today. As a poet, Remiraji's first collection of poems, A Harvest of Laughters, 1997, won both national and international recognition. Wandora Cantos, his seventh and latest collection of poetry, was published in November 2021. Some of his poems are available on lyricline.org, the international network of poets. Um, so please take some time to check it out. I'm going to post the link um, to the chat as well. So in case you're really interested in this. Professor Remiraji's book, Playful Blasphemies, post verbias as archetypes of modernity in Yoruba culture published in 2012, has received acclaimed a seminal work in contemporary African studies. In this book, Remiraji draws on the metaphor of Erei Beji, the twin image on fan blades, to reference duality of being as represented in post-verbiality and plurality of radical proverbial texts. He argues that the radical proverb is a shadow of the original, and fan blades represent the modernist base and the potential of the world, the shifting and revolving force of the new proverb. In addition to multiple literary and academic prizes, including the ANA Cadbury Prize won in Nigeria, the Ford Foundation Research Grant in the United States of America, the West African Research Council Prize, and the Harry Oppenheimer Award in South Africa. He also currently coordinates the multi-site Pan-African research project on the theory and practices of post proverbias in seven African countries. So this afternoon, we are going to be focusing on his work, which he has entitled to each proverb, its prothesis, the decomposition of a traditional African verbal art at the present time. So as they present this work, please feel free to use the chat button to type in your questions. There will also be an opportunity to use the raise hand button during the Q&A session. Please join me to welcome Professor Adiremi Oyelade as he presents his work. Welcome, Professor Remy. Okay, thank you very much, Adiola. Thank you, sir. And I'd like to thank uh, the management, the organizers of this uh, very special program. I've read about it. Um, and uh, coming at this time to, to feature in the Africa at Noon event of uh, University of uh, Wisconsin at Madison, uh, it seems almost like for me, uh, it's a personal celebration or anniversary because it just occurred to me today that this is the fifth year or maybe the second year of the launching of the post proverbial database online for seven uh, African countries and for 12 African languages. So uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. Uh, my presentation as um, it has been uh, um, announced is uh, to each proverb its processes, the decomposition of a traditional African verbal art at the present time. So uh, if you permit, I'm going to share my screen and then uh, um, share a number of slides 
uh, for this presentation. And uh, of course, um, there's also a, uh, an opportunity maybe to, to share this further uh, in video format in case the network uh, misbehaves. So I don't know if you are able to see this. Uh, Adiola, can you, are you able to see this? Yes, I can see it. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, my, uh, the, the, the title again is to each proverb, its processes, the decomposition of the traditional African verbal arts at the present time. Uh, the projector, the main point is to say, as has been introduced, that for every proverb, there is a potential, there is a possibility of another creation, especially uh, uh, within uh, the urban space. And of course, I refer to that as a process. Uh, I will get to the point where I will explain uh, precisely what I mean by that. Um, so, yeah, uh, for at this moment, I'm going to uh, present the summary of my, of my uh, uh, presentation. This is to show that there has been work done in proverb uh, studies, uh, in African studies. And the intention here is to uh, invite uh, attention, to turn attention to uh, a particular range of scholarship that is still very recent, which I refer to as radical paramelogy. But the precise term is indeed referred to as transgressive paramelogy. I will intend, uh, I intend also to give background to the post proverbia discourse itself and how I come to name it as the post proverbia. And in the course of my presentation, I will also uh, make reference to a couple of um, terminologies or points which uh, you find under uh, a grammar of the post proverbia trace. So, what is the prosthesis? Um, the prosthesis is that which makes the transformation, this transformative activity possible for what we refer to as Yoruba post proverbias. And this is very representative of many other African languages having worked within um, other African uh, language communities also uh, in the past five or six years. So I will intend to provide some uh, examples of Yoruba post proverbias. And um, those examples will fall within the categories that I've highlighted. And of course, uh, there is also the necessity to talk about the significance uh, of the value of the prosthetic activity. And in conclusion, um, I will end as I begin to say that to each proverb, it's shadow. So paramelogy is uh, the general discourse of proverbs, including the collection of it, the coalition, and indeed the interpretation of the verbal art. And so there is paramelography, which is uh, an aspect of paramelogy as a broad-based uh, scholarship of, of proverbs. And uh, for African proverb scholarship, uh, we consider it as almost a very important part of the introduction of African scholarship, African literary scholarship into the modern century. Uh, because the works of um, anthropologists, especially expatriate Africanists, uh, I, I has given a lot of meaning to their understanding of kinship systems, of, of so-called primitive societies. And so the study of Proverbs is very, very germane, it's very important, not only for anthropologists, but much more for linguists, for literary scholars, for cultural workers, for performance uh, 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 studies. 
And as I, as I said here, proverbs are crucial ethnographic materials for the interrogation of the laws and morals of a people. But indeed, if we stop there, then we realize that there has been so much work done. In spite of so much work done, further scholarship of African proverbs will seem like a tedium, more like a reflexive tedium, almost constantly, constantly repeated and repeatable. Um, the main uh, point raised by uh, Jean uh, Napet in the A to Z of African proverbs is very, very important and germane at this point is more again, is the repetition of that that everybody knows. That proverbs are important uh, as expressions of human wisdom uh, for the peoples of Africa, whether in the West or in the East or in the North or in the South, the proverb is vital. It's a vital part of the conversation in, of the people in everyday life. Uh, it contains the condensed experience of past generations, uh, which is couched in flowery language. So it is a rich heritage. The, uh, the uh, African studies has given so much to the world uh, by introducing proverbs of people, different uh, peoples within uh, uh, Africa. And then uh, in the work of Arrow Sherb, we're able to find over 105 languages uh, intimating their proverbs, whether in their original form, um, that is in their languages, or whether translated into any of the Europhone languages, especially English, French, Portuguese, or, um, or German. And so in the bibliography uh, by Arush, um, for almost uh, 350 pages, you have a huge list of publications in the original languages, including, as I said, um, English, French, German, and uh, Portuguese. So, and uh, here, this is one uh, very important resource material uh, that's, that's very useful for further studies or for further interrogation. Um, so, but really focusing on, um, on African, um, expertise works, uh, Samuel Ajayi Crowder, you know, beginning in the 18, 1852, right, it's in the middle of the uh, 19th century, up to Cristala, who worked on uh, Ashanti proverbs, Escobits on crew proverbs, William Bascom on uh, Yoruba proverbs and Arewa, and indeed Ruth Finnegan, who has worked not only just on Yoruba proverbs, but on Akan proverbs. And Ben Linfors and Oyekon Omoila in 1973, have uh, produced a very important work, uh, which I will still refer to in my next, uh, uh, I mean, the next uh, few slides. So uh, over time, in my studies of uh, African uh, uh, proverbs, um, I have drawn upon two broad, specific kinds of proverb scholarship. The first is referred to as the aesthetic rhetorical study. And the second is a cumulative archival study. Perhaps we can simply say that the first one, that is the aesthetic, is paramiological. Whereas the second one, that is a cumulative archival study, is paramiographical. That is, it's based on collation and annotation of text rather than even the critique of the text. Uh, very good examples of. Uh, the aesthetic rhetorical study include Quisi Yanka's The Proverb in the Context of Akan Rhetoric, uh, Mineke Shippa's Sources, Sources of All Evil, African Proverbs and Sayings on Women, uh, Adia Ekos, Proverbs, Textuality, Nativism in African Literature, and uh, Oyekon Oumuila's two books, Aki, Yoruba Pro Pro uh, Prostrictive and Prescriptive Proverbs, and uh, later Yoruba Proverbs, that's a compendium. So our focus then is to also indicate that for the cumulative archival study, I've also um, teased out five groups, five categories of paramographical works. First, uh, the African proverbs that are uh, collected or translated uh, into 
uh, English, German, French, Portuguese, these European uh, languages, but not to indigenous languages uh, for the users of the proverbs. And then the second group will be uh, those that were written in these European languages, or other non-African languages, uh, but collected and categorized along national borders, even if such national borders are artificial. And then the third category of uh, uh, the, the, the paramagraphical studies of African proverbs uh, is uh, uh, those proverbs that are produced uh, in single ethnic, single uh, linguistic uh, um, publications, but with, that, with or without translations. And then the fifth category refers to African proverbs that are drawn from different indigenous languages, but that are accompanied uh, by translations. And so the paramelogist activity is not new. And as I also said, there is a reflexive tedium to the scholarship of proverbs, whether African proverbs or non-African proverbs. And then, arose the idea of the discourse of radical paramelogy that is focusing on areas of difference, areas of transformations, in which case writing proverbs is no longer seen as just a mere formula that is fixed for particular peoples and to be only spoken by elders, especially for African uh, societies. Wolfgang Miller has done so much work uh, in the field of radical paramelogy. And in 1981, he entered at the study of innovations in, uh, in word proverbs. But uh, not until 1999 that he actually gave uh, the activity of proverbial reconstruction uh, a name. And the terminology that he used then, alongside another scholar, uh, Anna Litovkina, was, um, and still is, anti-proverb. And so all of these works, almost all of them have signs, intimations of transformations, transform, transformational activity of proverbs across cultures but located only in Europe and America and a number of other languages that are non-African. And what I have done, what I have attempted in my own field was to focus much more on African, African proverbs. But earlier, there have been, as I said, there have been intimations of variations, uh, even within uh, African scholarship of proverbs. For instance, um, in the 19, uh, I think it, in, in 2006, uh, Bostire Ogechi reflected on the possibility of changes of transformations of the creativity of the user and the speaker of the Gusi proverb. The Gusis are from Western uh, uh, side of Kenya. And as she puts it, uh, among the Gusi, the proverb, just as Yoruba, is meant to be twisted. It is twisted. It's a twisted word. Or it is made to bend. It is bent for effect and maybe for deeper effect. And that's the term kobayena among the gooses. And so Bosire Ogechi was well aware of the possibility of changes or variations within African proverb, using our own language as example. And of course, she said further, the user is free to reconstruct a proverb in order to make it appropriate in the particular context in which it is being used. To modify a proverb, one may delete, paraphrase, elaborate, or transfer elements in it. Now, something close to that, in fact, even much more instructive uh, has been done 
um, even a decade or two or three decades earlier, in 1973, um, working jointly with uh, Bent Linfos, um, produced or edited a book, um, Yoruba Proverbs Translation and Annotation. And in it, he made reference to the possibility of the radicalization of the Yoruba proverb. And this one in 1973, and stating, new proverbs are constantly being coined. They are at most times profoundly philosophical, sometimes expedient, sometimes mischievous, sometimes funny, but always they are refreshingly efficient in placing contemporary incidents within the continuum of tribal tradition. So with the observation of Bosirio Ogechi and the submission of Oyekon Owumila, we are aware that it is not exact to follow along the line of Ruth Finnegan that African proverbs have relative fixity. Their formula is almost sacrosanct. Uh, this was the scholarship in the 1970s. But now we know better that there are transformations and these transformations are what uh, I have been able to, you know, to track uh, within uh, what I call uh, radical paramelogy. The radical paramelogy is broad and it contains um, gestures to provide parallel proverbs, to provide variations or to adapt proverbs, all of these, uh, they are parts, all of these activities are part of radical paramelogy. But then it also involves um, doing some form of shift, some form of absolute changes, subversion uh, on the formula of the conventional program, especially paying attention to the structural level. This is what radical paramelogy uh, uh, entails and compasses. But then uh, there is an aspect of radical paramelogy that is focused mainly on absolute changes, radical changes, but not just only radical, but almost postmodernist and sometimes banal. And that I refer to as transgressive paramelogy. Transgressive paramelogy is much more specific, is much more exact about aesthetic and structural transformations that happen on traditional or conventional proverbs. And in, in, in that line, transgressive paramelogy uh, incorporates poems, rituals, verbal bluffs um, to the activity of recomposition, or shall I say, the decomposition of the traditional proverb so that the proverb then becomes recomposed and becomes a new material, a new cultural material. So twists and turns happen to the traditional proverb. Uh, there are examples that I will, I will provide in the next few slides, but first to, to, to note that the first attempt to make reference to the possibility of that change, intimation, is contained in a 1986 work by uh, Ulugo Ega Alaba, uh, who published uh, his Yoruba essay in Langbasa, that is the Journal of Yoruba Studies in the University of Lagos, Nigeria. But my first attempt to study uh, within the Department of English uh, materials that are indigenous, the proverb as verbal art, was in 1994, uh, which uh, a year after I presented at the seminar in the Department of English at the University of Baden. But it took about four years, some kind of elongated story uh, to arrive at the publication of this, of this essay that I presented at seminar uh, by Research in African Literatures in 1999. Uh, it's entitled post proverbials in Yoruba Culture, a Playful Blasphemy. Now, to name the act becomes an urgent exercise. Naming the act becomes very important because it seems like the theory comes after the practice. The practice has been immemorial. The practice has been embedded in, in the imagination of, of not just the youth, but almost every user 
of the proverbial text. But to name it, the naming started in 1999, but by, by 2004, I developed that, that theory uh, in an essay entitled, Posting the African Proverb, a Grammar of Yoruba Post Proverbias, or Logophagia Logoria, and the Grammar of Yoruba Post Proverbias. Uh, in Proverbium uh, Volume 21. And it was in that essay that I um, defined in a very cryptic manner post proverbias as playful parodies of conventional African proverbs. Um, it was even a large, a huge statement to make because then my focus then was just on Yoruba proverbs, but I said conventional African proverbs. It took another decade to arrive at the uh, confirmation of what I consider a very cryptic definition of the post proverbial uh, activity. Uh, furthermore, there are a number of uh, uh, explications that I needed to, to provide here, uh, you know, submitting to the idea of uh, the post proverbial text or the post proverbial activity. First, the post proverbial uh, is the critique of radical and overturned proverbial sayings, which emanate as alternate versions of culturally given and conventional proverbs. This is to say that the post proverbial cannot exist on its own, almost mutually ex ex exclusive from the conventional or traditional proverb. It exists because one other material exists before it. And so it is always in contest. And therefore, I said that. Uh, the post proverbial is uh, always in contest and is contesting the stability zone of Yoruba traditional or standard proverb. And that's, and that's uh, in the uh, 2012 uh, 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 book. But much more uh, recently, uh, in an introductory essay to the special publication on post proverbial in Matatu, uh, volume 51, number two of 2019, I note here. Uh, that if proverbs represent the traditional heritage of the people's philosophy, post proverbias then are the immaterial agency of the postmodernists and radical imaginaries of the post-colonial African mind. In other words, it's also a huge statement to make that the post proverbia is a the constructive critique of the tradition and philosophy of secret text, that is assumedly secret text. Now, so, uh, and over time, uh, maybe in the past um, uh, two, three decades, there has been um, a developing bibliography of research in post probability. Uh, there is very little difference between uh, what I refer to as post probabilities and what Gamida refers to as anti proverb. I mean, there has been a discussion over that, on that. So, with the works of Oyekon Omoyela in 2005, Eliza 2006, uh, Luatu Injegere 2008, Ademo Wa and Balogun 2015, Ahmad Kepacha working on um, Swahili post proverbials, Melita Alexa Vaga, and Olayinka Wileye, who just uh, completed a doctoral uh, thesis on feminist post proverbias at the University of Ibadan. This is to prove and to show that post probability is indeed a universal subculture. But then within the African language panels, it becomes much more important to do further work uh, in, this, in this area. So good things come to those who, of course, the completion is very crucial. And this is how the post proverbial text works. There's always something that is eluded. There's something that is crushed. There's almost something that is amputated. And so it is expected that as a test or also as play, the person who completes the proverb should either be aware of the proverb and then the proverbial formula uh, sits and is not, is not affected. Or it creates a new one, either deliberately in jest or ignorantly. So good things come to those who bait, or good things come to those 
who wait. Now, a grammar of the post proverbial trace. Uh, this is what uh, graphically uh, the conceptual activity uh, looks like. From radical paremiology, we come to the more specific work of violence on traditional proverbs, and which we call, which are referred to as transgressive paremiology, and the uh, preferred uh, terminology for that cultural material that is produced out of that engagement is post proverbia And the elements of post probability or the condition or the nature of the post probability is such that it is going to be a protege of the parent. It's going to be a surrogate of the parent. It is also a prosthesis of the original body. And the activity that happens is one that involves rebuffs, subversions, reefs, rebuters, and so on and so forth. So to each proverb, it's prosthesis. And so what is the prosthesis? In medicine, prosthesis means an artificial part or body that which is implanted. In linguistics, it is an adjustment, a lexical or syllabic extension to a word. In paremiology, prosthesis means lexical, actual, revisionary, amputated saying, which then functions more as a supplement. And that supplement is, in fact, an evidence or the eruption of the bluffs that happen to the typical proverb. So a prosthesis comes to being and used on the crest of an existing material, as I've said earlier, because that material requires or invites replacement, repl uh, invites a certain engagement with it so that it becomes decomposed first, and then it gets recomposed. And the activity, the strategy of that recomposition involves deletions, cutterage, and grafting. So that is more like what uh, French was referred to as la text, in which there is a, a superimposition of an idea over an idea, or of a translation of another translation. So in the reconstruction and delivery uh, of the typical proverb, the prosthetic activity predates the theoretical formulation. And I, I will explain this. Um, within uh, the typical African um, society, there's always the study of proverbs, especially in formal secondary school or primary school level. And children are always uh, expected to complete proverbs as part of their test. Uh, so as part of their test of arrival to wisdom. And so in attempting to construct or to complete the proverb formula, they end up reconstructing either out of ignorance or out of jest, so that what they produce will be inexact, will be incongruent with the proverbial formula. And uh, in, uh, in a 2021 uh, um, essay, I have um, explained this uh, clearly that students always ended up with fabrications in cases of their inability to provide the completing part of the given proverb. Also, in informal settings and social interactions, the radicalization of the proverb among the Yoruba was essentially a playful act. And apparently, the phenomenon has always accompanied the verbal act. It has accompanied it either as a deliberate or inadvertent practice without a name, without a label, 
or without a term. So the invention of the term post proverbia was meant to contain that immemorial activity. Yoruba post proverbia. In the next few slides, I will be, I will be uh, providing and giving examples of uh, such transformation, such proverbial transformations that have been recorded, that have been used, that have been used as part of um, quotidian daily conversation uh, that have also been used in performance, in, in songs, in music uh, by users, mostly the youthful one. So there are four categories. There are four main, four main categories of Yoruba post proverbials So category one is one in which the subordinate clause is um, excised, in which change occurs at the second part of the proverb text. If we imagine a proverb to be a sentence, um, a crisp nucleic sentence of at least two clauses, one is main clause, the other is subordinate clause, what happens in the subordinate clause is that a new idea, a new statement is brought to replace the original idea so that a new proverb is created. So that is the, the pattern uh, for uh, post proverbia category one. And there are three subtypes of this classical category. I refer to them as uh, type 1A, which is a simple suitor, uh, type 1B, which is a complex suitor, and type 1C, which is a parallel suitor. So um, let's take uh, just the pattern as we have here. The first uh, is to see graphically what happens. The conventional proverb or traditional proverb is P1, and the post proverbial is P2. And so transformation occurs at the second part, as I said. So we give this example. One of the most of uh, the, the post proverbial is Eshin Waju Ni Te Yungo Sari. It is the leading horse, is an example to other racers. That is the traditional proverb. The post-proverbial response to it or construction to it is that which is almost hacking at the directness without being philosophical about who comes first or the importance of being in front. But directly, the youthful the most imagination of the youth has a shinwaju nyoba okini, the leading horse we surely take the first position. And so um, another example is um, a day the dishonorable act does not end in 20 years, which gets transformed also at the subordinate clause level to a day dishonorable act never ends. Perhaps one more example, and uh, that is any toba lekumeji akufo. He who chases two rats will catch emptiness. He who, risk, uh, he who chases two cats will catch emptiness. That is the traditional proverb. The uh, post proverbial response to it is any toba lekumeji akpakon. He who chases two rats will kill one. Now, post proverbial type 1B, which I refer to as a complex one, um, allows for excision to happen um, in multiple forms, especially also at the subordinate level. So in this case, we have the main clause A, the subordinate clause, B1, the subordinate clause B2. And so what happens that for 
though both sides of the subordinate clause we have transformation. So uh, P1, we have Agbaton la Agbole, Bia Dashofun Agbalaru. The lazy man must be fully supported. When you buy him a cloth, you must also dye it, which gets reformed or retranslated uh, uh, with a new uh, idea uh, as Agbaton la Agbole, Bia. Now, we have uh, a type 1C, uh, which, which is parallel. There is a, there's, a, uh, there's an order uh, in such a way that transformation is parallel, both uh, in the first part, that is the main clause, and also in the subordinate clause. Take, uh, for instance, here. Bomadeba shubu awuwaju, bagbaba shubu awuwaju. When a child stumbles, she sets, her eyes on the destination. When an elder falls, she takes a backward glance. We gets reformulated into Bomodeba Shubu Asunkun, Bagwa Bashubu Adide. When a child stumbles, she bursts into tears. When the elder falls, she gets up. And so uh, that's for category one. For category two, transformation, shooter occurs are the signal clause. And there are at least two types of this. There is a one in which transformation happens at the head, at the main clause, but at the freestyle level. And there is the other one in which transformation happens at the head, at the, at the head level, at the main clause, but at the lexical level. That happens that in which case you just have just one word uh, making the difference in that transformation. Take for instance, Akmolini Yaka. It's sheer honor to be called court matriarch. Uh, there's no woman who does not have a proper name. And then from that stricture, there is a shuttering that makes transformation to occur at the freezer signal clause. So that you have Akmole Nimala. But because the transformation has happened at the signal clause, it goes further to change the pattern, to change the form like pattern of that proverb. So now you have it's sheer honor to be called Malam. The proper name to call an Ausa man is Ausa. Another example of uh, transformation happening at the Fraser. Uh, uh, level at the signal clause uh, is one about, about food and how we take food, which also um, uh, is a reference to a deeper meaning about the philosophy of life, about what people do. So first, uh, it is from the base that one eats the beans pudding. Uh, this is the traditional proverb that preaches perseverance, especially in terms of movement, in terms of growth, starting everything, starting a movement from the base. But it gets translated, transformed, uh, because of the new consciousness among the youth. Instead of saying, what we have is, so the only difference there is Pelebe, Gongo, Pelebe stands for base and Gongo stands for apex. It is from the apex that one eats the beans pudding. Now type 2B um, uh, also has uh, uh, transformation at the signal clause, in which case it's only the key word, just only one word that uh, makes the difference. And a very classical example, uh, which has Many, in fact, multiple uh, post proverbia is the traditional proverb, uh, um, that is something synecdocal uh, with head, that is with luck, we pick the good meat in the stew. 
But much more recently, you find um, in quotidian statements, in uh, interactional uh, statements, you find uh, people saying, that is suspending the idea of luck, but to the idea of deliberate, deliberate action um, with sight, we pick the good meat in the stew. And then another one, uh, apart from Oju, you have Owo la Fimeno Lawo. That is, with touch, we pick the good meat in the stew, uh, which is even much more deliberate, not just eyes alone, but with hand, something that is more, much more indexical, that is much more deliberate and physical. And then uh, post probabia category three is one in which rupture can occur either at the signal clause, can occur or at the completing clause, but the constant point, the constant activity is that of word play or pawn. There's always a word play, which will involve, especially for the tonality of the African language, switching either the word to mean another within the same proverb, and then it provides a totally different meaning. The structure does not change beyond that switching, either in tone or introduction of a very closely related word within uh, the proverbial uh, statement. For instance, a shuru sasheju otelo wo niyo is a traditional proverb uh, about the impossibility of using water yam to produce pounded yam. Therefore, the water yam overreaches its own sweetness. It loses the respect of the pounded yam seller. But in some strange tone or switch of tone, of tone and words, and this particularly is part of a statement recorded uh, at a, you know, at a, um, at a crusade, uh, a Christian uh, priest trying to appropriate the traditional proverb, Eshuru Shashiju, turns it around and says, Eshuru Shashiju. And then Eshu then becomes the godhead for Satanism or the devil. Eshu in Christian translation means Satan, uh, either wrongly or misguidedly. But Eshu, Ru Shashiju. Uh, from what I am, because of the space between that has been created between Eshu and Ru, the what I am becomes uh, a godhead. So Eshu Shashiju, Olorong Lugode, Satan overreaches himself, God waits in ambush for him. Just one, just one. Hello, Prof. I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Um, it would be great if you could please round off in about one to two minutes so you can take questions from the audience. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, the, 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 the forms that I've uh, presented here, they, they are inexhaustive of the various um, examples that are available. And of course they are contained in my 2012 book and a number of them are also available uh, on the uh, on the database uh, of the uh, post uh, uh, proverbial uh, dot com, and um, the 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 fifth example is uh, what I refer to as eponymous post proverbial. All of these are available on my on the on the database uh, that has been. Uh, uh, I, I think maybe what I will do is just to show this. Uh, this is a this is a, uh, 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 the, the link https uh, postprobabia.com. So if you are interested, apart from just checking for my poetry, you can check out postprobabia.com uh, for different African languages from Kenya, from Nigeria, uh, from Ghana, and so on and so forth. Um, so the value of the prosthetic activity is one in which there's always a radical turn, 
And uh, there's always a challenge of the traditional intelligence so that the conventional uh, ceases to be conventional again. Uh, in conclusion, the phenomenon of African post proverbialism is part of the evidence of urbanity and modernity uh, with the dynamic pressures on the structure of the verbal text. And finally, uh, as I started uh, with the currency of proverbs as cultural materials in different media and space, we have new certain new competences or incompetences as the case may be that makes the uh, production of the post proverbial possible through the potential of the prosthetic imagination. Therefore, my conclusion is that to each proverb its shadow, and to each proverb the potential of its processes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that wonderful pre presentation, Professor Emiraji. And I am going to be calling on the audience right now to please um, send your questions to the Q&A, or you can as well use the raise and feature to ask your question directly if you want to do that. So right now I have, I think like a comment in the chat that is um, wondering about the Akan proverb. Um, I'm trying to figure that out. So maybe you might want to say something about that. Um, what are the works that you've been able to explore in terms of proverbs um, that are related to that part of Africa from the Akantui culture? Um, I also have a question here from Pelumi Falajimi. Um, he said, Chino Achebe says among the Igbo's proverb is the palm oil with which words are, e are eaten. Similarly, Yoruba people say proverbs are the horses which words ride. If words are lost, we use proverbs to retrieve them. This is my question. With the example of the use of proverbs among the Igbo's and the Yorubas as cited above, do you think proverbs bridge gaps or perform certain roles in intercultural conversations? Do you wish to shed some light on the intercultural significance of proverbs? So that is one question that I have. And I also have another question for you. So maybe you take two at a time while we wait for others to post their question. I am interested in the discourse part of your presentation, Prof. So at some point you talked about the post proverbias as sometimes transgressive and some are transformation. And looking at this from the cosmology of, pros, uh, of proverbs, at least in the African culture or the Yoruba culture, at what point do we categorize these proverbs as transgression versus transformation? And would this also speak to this idea of you know, slang and such transformation or transgression? Are they at some point integrated into the pool of acceptable proverbs in the Yoruba culture, for example. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Diola. Um, uh, these are very, uh, very helpful, helpful questions. Uh, the, the question about Akan proverbs, you know, my focus uh, this afternoon uh, is on Yoruba proverbs. Uh, there's a huge, as I said, there's a huge uh, bibliography on uh, African proverbs, um, you know, going back, not just only Ari Shib's work, um, over, over 200 uh, African languages, um, only just a couple of African languages uh, do not have a word for, for proverb, as we know, as a pithy saying. Uh, there's, there are, truly, there are, there are a number of African, African language communities that do not have proverbs the way we imagine it in Igbo, uh, Yoruba, Usa, Fufude, uh, Akan, Ashanti, and the, and the rest. So uh, Peggy Apia's work uh, is, on the, is on the Akan. Kwesiyanka has also worked in, uh, uh, in that field. Uh, Helen Jita has worked uh, in that field. So um, my intention, uh, is to focus on Yoruba as an exemplar for the other African languages. There, there are areas of differences, but then I also noted that 
some of these um, uh, nationalist categories are forced because there's a definitionist idea of proverbs actually traveling from culture to culture that at the end of the day, you may not be able to, to give them a nationality that is better for us to say African proverbs. Um, and then proverbs and intercultural connections. Surely, um, it, is not, it is not just for anything that you find scholars, anthropologists, expeditionists, uh, archaeologists also interested in knowing the proverbs of the people, because in it is a kernel of the people's philosophy. In fact, proverbs can be said to be the first base of the philosophical imagination of African peoples. And so um, when you move from culture to culture, uh, when you obliterate the, the boundaries, those national boundaries, you find a lot of intercultural connection. I spent, I spent two, three weeks in, uh, in Tanzania, moving from Tanzania to Kenya to Uganda and collecting proverbs, not proverbs on the streets, not the one that we find in the books, setting one proverb against the other. And we find a lot of connections between one culture and the other. And it also allows for not just intercultural, but dialogic connections that allows understanding across across cultures. Now, um, about the discursive aspect, my, my attempt to make a difference between uh, transformations and transgressive. Yes, perhaps I should, I should um, state that we can actually um, highlight three movements or three waves of uh, the development of proverbs on the African continent. There is a pre-literate proverb, which we can refer to as the conventional or the traditional proverb, which, which will serve within the context of the relative fixity of Ruth Finnegan. This is, these are fossilized texts. These are pre-literate, and we can call these pre-colonial proverbs. Uh, and then there is, there, are, there is a group of proverbs that were invented or created. They were, not trans, they were not transgressive, but they were transformative. They transform old proverbs into new ones, or they were created on their own without any attempt to serve as alternate to the traditional proverbs. And they become modernist proverbs or they become colonial proverbs because of the lexical items, because of the ideas that you find in the proverbs. Uh, if you if you if you say uh, and then moto or taxi, uh, bagba Now that is not a transgressive proverb. It is a transformed proverb, a proverb that is newly created, that is newly coined. I suppose this was what Wumila was referring to in 1973, newly formed proverbs, sometimes playful, but not really, really subversive or transgressive as what uh, we, have, we have touched as post proverbial So these are transformative proverbs from pre-colonial to colonial, and then to the much more postmodernist or post-colonial proverbs which attempt to challenge the sense of the traditional proverb, which attempt to challenge the sense of the conventional proverb, or which even attempts to challenge or to turn over the idea of, of the modernist or the modern proverb. So between transformation and transgression, there's a, there's a wide gap be, between that which is transformed and that which is itself transgressive. Most of the examples I have provided here they are more of transgressive proverbs rather than transformed or modernist proverbs. Thank you very Thank much. You. So um, I, we have some more questions here, so I'll quickly read all of them to you. And I hope you are able to speak a little bit to each of them. 
So um, there is one from Steve. Um, the question is, if the coexistence of proverb and its processes is inevitable, can we say that post-proverbia is a contestation between sacred and secular binaries of African culture? And um, from Rachel, what of, I think, proverbs that involve code switching, which brings with it a whole bag of linguistic and pragmatic implications? Have you come across such proverbs in Yoruba paramiology? Um, there is a Swahili proverb, you must stop to pick something under the bed, you have to put, it, put in effort to succeed. Then comes its, I think, proverb, and the bed to bring sexual connotations into the mix. So all this transgression and transformation. And there is another question. Um, I think Professor Thompson tries to speak a little more to the Swahili proverbs there. Maybe she might want to chip in, I see in the chat. I have another question from um, Professor Yeku. Um, thank you for such an amazing talk. I wonder if you could say more about the recent role of the digital in the production of post probability Is there any possibility that social media texts of humor uniquely plug into the transformative character of post proverbs. And Olusha Gonshoeton has this. If proverbs are not sancosant, that is their composition not fixed, how useful are post proverbias in framing Yoruba epistemology? The invented proverbs archive social changes in society. At what point are transgressive proverbs useful socially? So yeah, this is gonna be the last batch of questions we're going to take. And I'll let Professor Remiraji quickly speak to this before we round off. Yeah, thank you very much, Adela. I hope I'll be able to, um, to respond to all of these questions. Very, 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 very good. And again, uh, insightful questions. Uh, some to me sound like statements or uh, a pointer to do more work uh, in the field. Now, uh, the sacred secular binary of, uh, of proverbs and post proverbia is evident in the way that even some proverbs, I'm limiting myself to the Yoruba proverbs now, that some proverbs are expected only to be said by adults. So that when somebody who is younger utters such proverbs or within a community, they always you know, uh, either uh, start with something like, oh, as the elders say, I mean, there's something, there's something um, uh, almost reflexive about that to say that, yes, the elders use this and it is sacred and I have to use it the way they have taught us to use it. Or they end it by saying, Toto Shebio, oh, it is like a proverb. But then what happens in the urban imagination is that what we call sacred is no longer sacred because of the possibility. And of course, I connect that with uh, uh, James Yaku's idea of the social uh, media proverbs, the possibility of, um, of becoming an authority onto oneself, of creating, because we know that the sacred proverbs have the quality of anonymity. But in modern times, there is always the intention to turn over the proverb text and create a new one. So shall we say then from the sacred, we secularize it. So the idea of that dyad between the sacred and secular binary uh, is an interesting uh, uh, observation. Now, code switching, uh, whether they exist in, in, in Yoruba proverbs, surely. Uh, because as we said, urbanity, Western education, um, encounter with a new language, especially English or Aousa or Arabic, all of these form part of the base for that prosthetic imagination, for that prosthetic activity. For instance, the one that is very, very popular, and I'm sure Adiola would still remember this, if you know. 
Now, what you have in the traditional, in the, in the traditional imagination is that you take a long time, you are circumspective about what kind of danger that comes before you. So that tall tree that is about to poke you in the eye, you try to avoid it right from afar. That is, that is the proverb. But in switching it, in transforming it, and making it, and providing a prosthetic uh, uh, additment to it, or a supplement to it, it becomes Now, there is no word dodge. Dodge is an English word. And so it has escaped into that invented proverb. And there are, there are other examples, in which case you have not just only uh, English uh, lexical items, you have Arabic lexical items, you have, you have, uh, you have uh, Ahusa lexical items. Another example is uh, um, uh, something about uh, the cats not being in the house, and then the mouse becoming the thief. I see Leo Lombo, Ile Dile Kute. That is the traditional proverb, conventional proverb. But what you have now, um, especially in a number of uh, you know Yoruba films in Hollywood, see post probability is subserving much of a number of the characters that are created in Hollywood. So I see Leo Lombo, Ile Dile Kute. Uh, becomes a silly olongbo. T. Mehaya findi megida. Now, Mehaya, it's a lumping of two, two, two languages. Mehaya is Ausa and English, and then Ausa megida. So that's that's the example of um, the code switching activity in the in the transgressive proverbs. Now, um, social media has been awash with a lot of transformation, a lot of transgressions, proverbs. Um, there's an essay, you know, uh, on on nice uh, Abolore uh, Akonde, uh, the, the musician. Uh, I mean, there is that point that almost every one of his songs have at least a, a, a proverbial base. But people have also not noticed that there's a lot of post proverbial points in the work of Abolore Akonde. Uh, so I, uh, I think it's, uh, yeah. it's a word in continuum and it's something uh, that is, um, uh, that can also possibly be extended on. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, at this point, I want to say thank you everyone for your time. Um, it's 10 minutes past one. We want to respect everybody's time. And we really appreciate Professor Remiraji's presentation today. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And I am sure he's happy to take your um, questions. If you want extra you know, um, interaction with him, you can reach him via email. Um, and I want to also use this moment to say um, a very huge thank you to the African Studies Program team for this wonderful initiative in which we are able to have scholars from Africa present their research at the Africa at Noon series. I want to thank Professor Madureira and um, all our colleagues and friends of Africa um, studies program from UW Madison and outside of Wisconsin for your time and for participating in this great talk. Thank you so much. Um, and on this note, I would want to say bye everyone and feel free. I am sure the video recording is also available. So um, African Studies Program is going to be sharing this via YouTube and they usually publish this um, on the newsletter. So feel free to click on it to assess Professor Remiraji's um, talk. Thank you so much everyone and have a very wonderful afternoon.